Hello, and welcome to today's KDP University's At Home with MD Cooper. I'm Trisha, and for the past five years, I've moved around Amazon's books teams, learning the business so I can share it with authors. Prior to coming to Amazon, I worked as a graphic artist, project manager, and educator. Currently, I'm privileged to work on the KDP University team, helping authors use the KDP website to make the most of their author journey. But enough about me, we're here to talk about Mallory. Mallory Cooper likes to think of herself as a dreamer and wanderer whose feet occasionally touch the ground. A 20 year software development veteran, her experiences there translated well into the realm of science fiction. A maker from an early age, Mallory loves to craft things from furniture to cosplay costumes to a well-spun tail. She can't help but to create new things every day. As a rare extroverted writer, she loves to hang out with readers and people in general. She shares her home with a brilliant young girl, her wonderful wife, who also writes, a cat that chirps at birds, a never ending list of things that she would like to build and plenty of ideas. Welcome Mallory. Hey, hey there, thanks for having me. Of course, we're thrilled to have you join us today. All right. <laughs> Happy to be here. Sorry, I was like adjusting my screen. That's okay. I was I was having one of those panic moments where I'm like, oh, do we have a delay again? Nope. This is okay. My work. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, and let's get started by talking a little bit about what interested you and how you got into writing. Well, um, for me, it started back when I was, I want to say I was 10 or 11, maybe 12 years old. I, I'd gotten into reading in fantasy and like through things like um, uh, Chronicles of Narnia. And then I moved into things like The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings from there. And after reading Lord of the Rings, I didn't want the story to end. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I learned like at that point, the only, there was like no more stories. I'm like, what do you mean there are no more stories? So I started writing my own. Um, you know, and I sort of created my own worlds and started writing stories in them. And um, it was it was very much Lord of the Rings fan fiction at the beginning because there was a ring, you know, someone had to get it somewhere, <laughs> something like that. But um, but yeah, I just kept writing over the years and um, and writing more and more stories. And I think it was back in like 2008 or 2009, I had um, finished my first story that I thought was good enough to possibly get published. And I started shopping around um, trying to find an agent. And after like a year and a half of that, I'm like, I'm going to die before I get like two or three books published at this rate. You know, like, it just takes so long. That's sort of a fatalistic way of looking at it. But I just was like, I have so many stories to want to tell. And like, it's, it's going to take five to 10 years to tell one at this rate. So um, that was that, that, at that, that point, KDP had come along and the Kindle and all that. And um, my wife, Took one of her stories and put it up on KDP, and it was so freaking easy that I decided to do it too. And um, I made a lot of mistakes in the early years, so I didn't get in in some of the early booms, but I figured things out. And um, in 2016, started selling well enough that I was able to go full time as an author. It's amazing. So we're looking at, if I'm doing the math right, and I never do the math right, you know, so we're looking at five, six years before things kind of really started taking off for you. Yeah, about that. About I was maybe five years before I really figured out how to make it all work and understood the, the market well enough and the business well enough to actually to to need, know what you need to know to to write and market books. Right, and I think that's this, a great call out. Some people think, okay, we put it up on uh, KDP and then it's instant success. But it takes yeah. a lot of learning and time to develop the business end of it. I yeah, think that it that's does. a key point. It's so much easier now than it was then because back in 2011, like no one knew how to market indie published ebooks on the internet using Amazon, using Amazon Kindle, right? Like no one had a clue. It's like, do we do book tours? Do we write blogs? What do we do? But now there's so much information out there. Like I mean, you guys even doing this, like helping authors understand what to do. There's it's 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 the information is just out there waiting for people to, to jump into. But you do need to do the legwork. You are running a small business basically if if you want to do this as a job. Right. So what were some of those early learnings that you're like, if I had known this back then? Um, I think the one that really screwed me up the most 
was not understanding how the um, how the the recommendations work, like so the, the also lots. Um, I had so many friends who were like wrote all sorts of different things. I write I write military science fiction, and most of my friends don't. So you know, I would get them to promote my books and whatnot, and completely screwed up my also lots. You know, so Amazon obviously had no idea how to market my book for me because um, everybody they showed it to read romance, you know, or something like that. Here's this military science fiction book sitting in there. Um, so that was one way I screwed it up. Um, I also didn't I didn't do the right kind of marketing. I didn't focus on having a mailing list. I didn't I didn't get a professional cover. You know, I did a lot of mis a lot of rookie mistakes basically. But the right. amazing thing is, I recovered from those rookie mistakes. And the book that I published in 2012 that sold maybe 500 copies across four four to five years. Once I figured out how to market it properly, that same book um, ended up making probably sixty thousand dollars. So, wow, big yeah. difference. Yeah. So you can, you know, people, some people despair. They're like, well, it didn't, it wasn't a flash in the pan. You know, it was a field of dreams. I built it. And they didn't come, you know, so they, they feel like they can't, they can't recover from that, but you can like you've, that's the great thing about writing books. It's this thing you've made that you could actually like market and sell for the rest of your life. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really awesome. Yeah. Going back in backlist titles make, you know, I don't know about just about as much money as your, your front list or the thing, your new releases. Um, they, yeah, they certainly can if the backlist is big enough. Right, right. Um, and you talked just a minute ago about the also bots. So I just want to talk about those for just a second so to make sure everybody understands what that means. Mm -hmm. It's when on your detail page, when somebody gets to your detail page or somebody else's detail page, there's a line that says people who looked at this also bought or also were interested in this. And being able to have share your book with other sci-fi authors are what what you want to do because I think it is a rookie mistake you get in with a group of authors that are your friends but they're not writing in the same genre and yeah. and that can that can um confuse other readers because that's yeah. not your target audience yeah exactly because they'll look at my book and they'll say people who read this book also read all these other books and they're all their books not in the genre at all and vice versa on their pages, my book's going to show up. And of course, no one's going to buy it because they're like, I'm here for for this other genre. Right. Uh, and that can, be, that, that can also happen with your, with a lot of times when you release your foot, first book, your friends and family all buy it. They might read wildly different things. So that that can actually also screw up your also bought. So it's really, mm -hmm. it's really when you release a book, you really want to make sure the first people who buy and read your book are people who read that genre. And that's, I think, I think of all the initial things that people can do when they get their books out. That's like one of the most important things. And it's also one of the things that's easiest to screw up because your family is so excited. They all want to buy your book. You know? Right. Everybody wants to get in on it and support yeah. you because they love you. And yeah. you're like, no, please don't buy my book. I'll give you a copy. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> all right. So one of the things that you've discovered over the years and you've gotten incredibly good at is your branding and your advertising. So let's talk about it. You hit on it a little bit when you talked about the professional cover, but it's mm -hmm. more than just the professional cover. So let's talk about your branding sure. for a minute. So your covers are very specific to you. When you see an MD Cooper cover, that's like, oh, it's you. Yep. The chances are you're gonna know that. I um it was interesting because when I first started, um to indie publishing, getting professional covers done, I decided I just immediately just decided to do character covers because all the science fiction I had read growing up had characters on the cover. You know, I read a lot of Anne McCaffrey, um, Robert Heinlein, um, you know, um, Elizabeth Moon. I read a lot of female science fiction authors. I kind of grew up on them, um, and they they all had characters on the cover all the time. So I always just assumed that was the thing to do. And at that point, indie um, science fiction was all spaceships. Because it's it's honestly cheaper and easier to put a spaceship on the cover of the book than as a character. You have to worry about cutting off the hair and lighting them properly and props and stuff like that. It's a much harder thing to do. Um, but I just I almost didn't even think about it. like of course I want a character on the front of my book. And um, it was in, it was it was sort of a lucky um, thing that I did that because I was able to appeal to a lot of people who also weren't used to seeing sci-fi books with character covers and whatnot. But then in addition, I'm writing military science fiction with um, strong female characters as the leads. I have books where there are no men 
in the books at all. Like it's kind of it's kind of like like I'm sure if you've heard of the Bechtel test, which is like the test to see if a movie has two female characters who talk to each other, two named female characters who talk to each other about something other than men. Mm -hmm. um, I have books that failed reverse special test where there are no men to talk about named male characters to talk about anything. And so I'm in this in this genre of military science fiction, which is like not what you'd expect. I'm I, I, I'm fairly unique in that. Um, but I built a really strong brand where I, I stuck with my guns. I'm like, no, I want to tell these stories and I want to I want to um, I want to I want to present my my stories this way with with women um, on the covers of this of the books and whatnot. And um, I found an audience by doing that, by being consistent, and by making my, making sure it, it looked professional and well done. Um, and and I'm also kind of known for cat suits. I love cat suits. I'm actually like I'm wearing a cat suit right now. And a lot of my characters wear cat suits. And the funny thing is, it's actually all based in science. There's actually a reason why you'd want to wear that in space and not something baggy. Um, and so, so if anyone ever calls me out, I'm like actually like this is the scientific reason why you'd want to wear a cat suit in space. But um, but I, as I added more and more books, I want to really want to make sure that you could just look at a book and you could tell it was an M.D. Cooper book mm -hmm. by the character, by the, 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 the brightness of the colors, by the lighting, by a lot of branding things I do. Like on every single book I have, my author name is the same size and in the same font, for example. You know, stuff like that is, is really consistent across all my books. Um, and I do that on purpose because I, I want to make it so that it's just like it's just instant. You know, this mm -hmm. is a M.D. Cooper book when you see it. Right. But you also, let's go back to that, those cat suits. You go sure. to a lot of events and it is definitely something where when you are in an event, you're rocking the cat suit and you stand out. It's so good. talk about that. How, how is that received at these reader events? I was so worried the first time I did it. I'm like, this is such a silly thing to do, but I'm like, I don't know, I, I, I like wearing them. I feel empowered when I wear them. Um, it matches my brand from my books as well, you know? Um, and so the very first time I did it, like people loved it. They came up to me and they want to take pictures of, with me and stuff like that. And I looked around at the other authors and I realized that a few of them did do things. Like one guy was always wearing a steampunk outfit. There are these two ladies that had like, they were wearing sort of like retro 50s sci-fi dresses. So they looked like they're all, they're all silver and shiny, but they, but they had like the victory curl in their hair and stuff like that. Right. Like they, they had like a unique brand and people were attracted to that. They thought it was interesting. And it's also really memorable. Like I don't remember many of the authors that were at that particular event, or at least I don't remember what they looked like. I don't remember their booths and whatnot, but I remember the authors who were distinct, you know, and who stood out and and where their brand was consistent with the brand of their books as well. So um, I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe this could work. And um, I've done it at a, at a number of events. I do it at author events too, um, yeah. you know, because people people know where I am. I like, they don't forget me, you know, kind of thing. And I get, normally the, the, the a general, Bit of conventional wisdom is don't market to authors they're not actually your readers but i have a lot of authors who actually read me as well because they i'm sort of memorable <laughs> right good... all right so you do a lot of social media marketing mm -hmm. um that i would it be accurate to say that's your primary method of marketing yep yeah, absolutely okay so let's talk about that um how did you create your social media plan and then how do you execute it um, well, my wife and I, um, who also writes, like you mentioned, uh, Jill, she's the one who really first started marketing on Facebook. I've been involved in internet marketing for a long time, but internet marketing in general and internet marketing on Facebook are very different things because Facebook wants your ads to look a certain way. And if you try to make traditionally looking at looking at ads on Facebook, they don't want to show them because um, Facebook wants ads that don't look like ads. They want ads to look like just regular posts. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of a, it's a bit of a sea change to get yourself in the mindset. And Jill adapted to that faster than I did. Um, and we started running ads on Facebook and it really started to make a difference in our business. So we started like experimenting a lot. Like we spent years experimenting with different ways to run ads and, and different ways to build things. Um, and we we jump. One of the things that one of the things I've believed for a very long time is if you want to market on a platform, you need to be a user of that platform. You need to understand how people use the platform, how they interact with it what works, what doesn't, and a lot of the stuff you just can't learn from the outside. So I just dove forward and became a full-on Facebook addict um, and really like, you know, joined lots of groups, understand, tried to understand how people like to use groups, what the settings meant, how things became visible and not visible on Facebook, and um, leveraged that to do things like, have a, I have a Facebook group where my fans post in it five to 10 times a day. Um, I post in it like three or four times a week. Like I almost don't need to do anything to manage it. It has really good engagement, but I post things in my Facebook group pretty much everybody sees it that's in the group. Uh -huh. 
um, which is an important thing on social media. I've got, um, I've just about maxed out my friends list at uh, 5,000 people. When I post something, when I post like an engaging piece of content on my profile on Facebook, I'll get like hundreds of comments, you know, and I'll sometimes get like thousands of people that have seen these posts. So I did a lot of work in being engaged and being present and, and understanding how the platform works to make sure that when I would do things, people would see it. And then on top of that, running ads on Facebook was was sort of the the, the crown of it all where, where I have the ability, like Facebook has 3.5 billion people using the platform. It's still the most popular platform of any sort in the world. Um, I guess with the exception of Google uh, as, a, as a search platform, but it's incredibly popular and um, you know, you can reach a lot of people using that. So that was, that was really important. And I guess one of the things too is to be, is I believe that you have to be bold. Um, there are a lot of books that are out there being published all the time. There are a lot of people talking about their stories and whatnot, and, and you have to stand out and that ties into the whole branding thing. But in addition, you have to be like not afraid to stand out. And it's super hard for authors to do this. The first time that my wife was talking to me about marketing and what I needed to do to like push my books, this was back in 2012. She's like, you gotta pimp yourself. You gotta get out there and talk about yourself and talk about your books and stuff like that. And I, I can't do that. Like, it, it feels dirty, it feels wrong, you know, um, to promote yourself. But that's sort of like a thing you have to do as an independent author. And I think it's sort of, it, it's become rather accepted that people who are, who are running small businesses and trying trying to make money promote themselves. And if you do it in an authentic way and you're honest and you're you're open with people, they're not gonna see it as gimmicky. They're gonna see you as just being yourself and, and saying like, hey, I've got this thing. Anyone wanna try it out? Mm -hmm. So let's talk, let's dig a little bit deeper into that because you were part of the author community and you were writing and you had an author following and a brand before you transitioned. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about that for just a minute. How, first of all, that must have been terrifying. Oh, and then, yes. um, but you have to be authentic to yourself too, yeah. with your author brand. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your journey um, through the transition and how that impacted the business and your fo author following. Sure. I mean, yes. Yeah, so when you come out as, as transgender, um, at least for people my age, young, the younger generations have a bit of a different scenario. But when you're older and you come out as, as transgender, it's kind of like an act of desperation almost. Where you're just like, I've lived my whole life in this box and I can't handle it anymore and I have to come out. But the problem is that you've you've established this life um, where everybody believes that you're something you're not because you've been telling them you're something you're not for you know the last several decades. So when you have to, and, and of course this applies as well to being um, to any being anywhere else in, in LGBT, but in tra being transgender is one of those things you can't really hide quite as well. You know, right. like you know if you're if you're gay and you're walking down the street, you know by yourself, no one knows you're gay. But if you're trans and you're walking down the street, especially at the beginning, because it takes a while for your body to change and whatnot. Um, it's very obvious that you're trans and it's not the sort of thing you can hide. Um, so you have to sort of like, you have to get to a point where you're prepared to lose everything um, mm -hmm. to, to be authentic and be yourself. On the plus side, when you do come out, it's such a relief. That you, you're sort of like, you just, joy is just spilling out of you, out of every pore, because you're just like, I finally get to be myself. And in this day and age, you don't really, the, the fallout isn't as bad as, as it used to be for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if you live in in certain locations in the world, it's it's better than others. But even in uh, even in like across, I've traveled across the United States after since coming out. I mean, I only I was only actually out for like nine months before COVID hit. But I was doing a lot of com conferences and conventions, so I did travel a lot. And I actually never ran into anyone in person who said anything rude or mean spirited or anything to me, mm -hmm. uh, and never had a bad experience or anything like that with anyone confronting me in any way. Right. Um, so it's much better than it used to be. It was actually, it's actually generally been a really empowering experience. The one tricky part of it is, like, is, what, is the sort of stories that I write. I write military science fiction. The majority of my readers um, have viewpoints that are ideologically opposed to the acceptance of trans people. Um, and whether or not they actively have those viewpoints or they're sort of like surrounded by people who have those viewpoints and they're sort of like, it's, it's kind of the only viewpoint they know. Um, it didn't change the fact that I knew I was going to lose some readers, and I did. I lost about forty percent of my readers mm -hmm. uh, after coming out. So that was that was a pretty big blow, and it was rough to see to see my income and um, and sales drop by a significant amount after coming out. And as I mean, it wasn't like immediate because it took a while while for a lot of people to realize that I was trans. But as they did, I started. And I you know I would get the emails and whatnot saying I'm not reading you anymore because you're trans and stuff like that. Yeah. But at the same time, like. 
the author community itself has been so supportive because authors are generally people who are pretty good at putting themselves in other people's shoes. That's kind of what we do for a living. And authors, I mean, you think about like half, half the authors I know, they write about like werewolf shifters being in heat, you know, and, and stuff like that and having sex in animal form and stuff like that. So quite honestly, transgender is like kind of tame compared to what a lot of <laughs> So it's so for a lot of authors, they're like, they change genders. I want to change into an elephant. Like this is right. per perfectly normal as far as I'm concerned. So so that was really great being being in this really uplifting community of authors and people who are really supportive. Um, the I would actually say there's certain that the author community actually really got me through a lot by mm -hmm. having all the people who 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 were, sent me so many messages about about how I um I inspired them and how they they thought it was so amazing and brave for me to do this and it's inspired mm -hmm. them to do things in their lives. It was it's been it's been an amazing experience, quite honestly. Good. Have you been able to then gain readership back um, and start keep continue building that readership? Or because I'm wondering if it happened right before COVID. COVID mm -hmm. obviously impacted your ability to do something that I know that you do really well, which is go to events and interact with readership. So yeah. I'm just wondering how you've been able to bridge that. So yeah, it's been it's been a bit interesting. I've not gotten back to where I was income wise before I came out. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that's also because one of the things I learned after coming out was that it takes a really long time to grapple with a lot of things you have to go through after you come out. Um, so much of you have to like look at yourself and like decide like how much of the way I am is the way that I that I I had to be like how much is the mask that I would put on to hide who I really am um, which many times was like an active effort that I consumed a lot of thought during almost every day um, also like you I, I you you have like this ideal view of what things are going to be like like oh you know this is my ideal view of what I would be like if I wasn't born in the wrong body. Um, and then you also have things like, here's what society tells me that being a woman should be like and whatnot. And I feel like you have to take all of those different things and figure out where in that giant, where in that Venn diagram is actually you, you know? And that took like a year of really spending a lot of time thinking about that. And um, it's it slowed down my writing quite a bit. So I, I wrote, like for example, in 2018, I, I put out 44 books. Um, in 2019, I put out maybe 22 books. 2020 was maybe 16 and I've only put out three books this year um, okay. and two of them were co-authored actually and I've actually managed to stabilize my income to the point where I make about the same amount of money every single month even without publishing books um, which is actually something that in a way I'm actually more proud of than the fact that I was able to slam out I mean 20, 44 books in 2018 is actually something I'll always be proud of to be honest that's, <laughs> that's crazy that's really the thing um but at the same time, I'm like, I'm like, I'm actually rather proud that like I can take it easy and kind of actually live the life that I hoped I could always live and make more than enough money to live on and like kind of not have to work that much if I don't want to. It's it's pretty freaking amazing. And part of that was when I started this whole thing, sort of a quick segue back, um, when you mentioned backlists, when I started writing, I, so many authors were like, this is feast or famine, you know, you're gonna have great times, you're gonna have bad times. I'm like, okay. Um, every single author seems to eventually have their their amazing thing they're doing not work anymore. So I need to build a massive backlist um, as quickly as possible, and that's and that's actually been like an amazing thing. It's like completely saved me um, uh -huh. COVID and through trying to deal with with being trans and what all that means. So it's been it's been great. I, the fact that like I can I can probably release no new books for the next year and not see my income change, which is wow. pretty pretty amazing thing to be in this position, you know. So how are you doing that? I mean, I know you're using the backlist, but how are you marketing the backlist so that it it creates that steady income? Um, there's a there's a variety of things that we're doing. Um, Facebook ads are the mainstay um, mm -hmm. of um, our stability, and that it's it's amazing. Like face, Facebook is the one is the best platform for advertising because you can reach, like I said, about half of the global population with Facebook. And on top of that. Facebook, you just spend more money and you're gonna make more money, provided you're doing your ads properly and know how they're working and understand your ROI and stuff like that. I could just turn a knob and get more money, um, which is kind of a wild thing to be able to do. Um, and at the same time, like I don't turn it too high because I don't wanna saturate the market. What I wanna do is be able to have this steady income for years. I don't wanna make it all in one year. I wanna have this nice, um, easy income. For, I actually, it's crazy. I looked at my KDP reports, um, for this year and like every month it was like a flat line 
I was like, this is insane. How have we managed to do this? It's amazing. So there's so there's that. Um, we also revamped the AM14 website this year um, because I wanted to really leverage getting more organic traffic and making sure that my website's the thing that converts. And we have like um, 10,000 page views a day now on, on my on my AM14 website. So it gets a lot of activity and that drives a lot mm -hmm. of sales. And that allows me to build my mailing list without doing a lot of a lot of extra work. And mailing lists are great because it's like, you, you, you might have to work a bit to get someone's email address, but once you do, you can market to them for almost free, you mm -hmm. know, as long as they stay subscribed, which is a great thing to do too. So there's a lot of that. And then a lot of um, building omnibus editions out of series and then running sales on those um, has, been a, has been a mainstay as well. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the, the website. I don't think we spend enough time talking about the website. And to your point, that's a, a key, key place for people to convert to, to a reader for your mm -hmm. brand. What are some of the changes that you made to your website that were key? Um, well, for, I, I cr like writing 110, maybe it's 115, it's somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, books mm -hmm. in a single universe is great in some regards because if you have like even half decent read through throughout your universe, you can make a ton of money. Um, if someone reads all of my books, I make about $250 oh, wow. um, to go and read all my books. So if I can, if I can bring in just one reader and get them hooked, you know, that's a significant amount of money that I can make from doing that. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people look at my at Aeon 14, which is the, the name of the universe I made, and they're like, this is huge. I don't think I'm ready to invest in something like this. Or they're like, where do I start? There's 23 different series that I've mm -hmm. written in this universe. So they have no idea where to start. So a big focus I put in the website was where to start. And there's there's like a page that describes where you might want to start. There's a quiz that people can take um, to help them start. And it's like, it's like which which you know show do you like? Do you like Battlestar Galactica? Do you like Star Wars and stuff like that? And if they think Battlestar Galactica, it's like, what if that's not available right now? Which which um, which of these shows would you pick? And if they pick Star Trek, it's like, quick, what's your favorite captain, you know, and stuff like that. So it's this fun little thing that takes them through and then suggests different books based on what they what they pick. So um, that's been working really well. And then I've also tied that in with the Facebook Pixel. So I actually do, that turns into a lead capture thing for me. So once they finish that quiz, I can then start showing them ads um, saying like, hey, what, you, which book did you pick? You know, have you, have you grabbed it yet? Do you like it? Stuff like that. So it's, it's a it's, lot of, a lot of thinking about how to like really connect with readers and nurture them through their journey and and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's key because your your reader base is very interactive online and they love games and they love those quizzes. And, and I think that that's a, a key takeaway is that knowing your audience helps you create your marketing strategy. Yeah, totally. It really does. And it's, and, and the, why it's great, it's great that I write in in a genre that I love to read because I know exactly what I would like. I'm like, oh, this is something I would I would totally take this quiz, you know, and stuff like that. So, and I plan on adding more. Like, I plan on adding like, um, you know, having a bunch of my characters and saying which one are you, and then having people go through a quiz and finding like, I'm a Sarah, I'm a Tannis, you know, I'm a Jessica, or something uh -huh. like that, which would be interesting because the majority of my readership is men. But you know what? <laughs> they, they'll be okay. They can handle it. If they, well, if they we, read my books, they're okay with with a lot of strong women. <laughs> right. Right. And we have a question. Um, are any of your characters trans characters? Yeah, there actually are a number of trans characters. Um, there's the, the future that I write, write about, um, the stories take place between about the year 3000 and the year 9000. And one of the things that um, that is never, never used is LGBT, lesbian, gay, trans, all that stuff. Those words don't exist in the books because it's a future where just like no one gives a shit. Um, I mean, they might give a shit, you're, they're attracted to you and whatnot, but in general, they're like, I don't care, you know, what you look like or who you sleep with, you know, or anything like that. Um, it's a future, because you can imagine, like, even right now, the way people are starting to get tattooed more, because you can get amazing tattoos and all sorts of colors. People are doing all sorts of body mods. People are getting horns put on their head and stuff like that. Imagine when gender changes outpatient surgery, because that's, I, like, what you get in the future. People are going to do some... Gender change is going to be like the least of the weird shit that people do. Every half of them are going to have tails. People are going to have claws. You know, it's going to get weird. Um, right. So I, I sort of I envision this future like that. I'm like, no one's going to care. So so yeah, I have a lot of characters. Sometimes some of them, sometimes they'll just casually change gender, and you'll be reading a book, and suddenly a, a he is a she, or a she is a he. And there's like there's actually like no one even bats an eye. It's just the pronouns change. Um, and maybe a bit of the character description changes and everything keeps going. Some characters, it's a little more visible. Like one of the characters um, is gender fluid and is constantly changing genders and stuff like that, which is great for them because they're also a spy. 
so it's it's handy for them to look completely different all the time but um but yeah there's a lot of that there's also intersex people that are in the mix there as well because that's that's the thing that i think would still happen and um and people are a lot more open and free with affection and how they think of relationships too in the future because they live for hundreds of years so the idea Mm -hmm. of like finding someone when you're 20 and then spending the next 350 years with them would seem of course completely ludicrous you know to these folks as well so they're much more fluid with how they um, are open to to loving and accepting and interacting with other people. There's a lot of the, the a lot of the rules that humans had to have in place to survive this long don't apply to them. So there's they kind of operate in a different way. And it's a lot of fun to write about that. Now you write in the same universe all the time, right? Are all your books in the same universe? Yeah, all of them are. How do you keep track of who's doing what in that universe? I think that's something that comes up frequently is, is how do you remember all those characters and what's happening and where you are in that timeline? Yeah, it's it's tricky because it's not, we're not writing it linearly. Um, Cause I have a couple of co-authors working with me in certain parts of it as well. But there's their stories taking place around the year 3000, around the year 4200. Uh, the year 5,500, and then a couple of stories taking place in the late 90th century. Um, and they're all, they, they, some of them have intertwined elements and stuff like that. And um, some of the, one of the things that saved my bacon was um, I write at the beginning of every book, I write it previously, like previously in this, in this series, because sometimes um, I'll, I'll be releasing, a, back when I was releasing a book almost every week, you might have four or five books come out between book one and book two in a given series. Mm-hmm. So my readers were, were constantly, couldn't quite remember where they were in a given series because I'd read five of my other books in the meantime kind of thing. And um, so that previously thing actually helped me a lot too. I'm like, did this happen in this book? I can just read this one page summary to determine if, you know, if, if an event happened. And I actually put character lists in the front of every single book. I used to put them in the back, but now I put them in the front. Um, because I'm, I want to make sure that people get that refresher. And that actually helps me a lot too, just by having that character list um, where people are, you know, some details about them. And um, and the other thing that helps me a lot is that in every single one of my chapters, because I'm a, I'm a sci-fi nerd, there's a lo- there's the title chapter title, and then there's a date and a location and a region for where that chapter takes place. So I'm like, okay, I know that like, you know, Tannis was somewhere in this star system um, in the middle of this book, I can go find the exact date and the name of the planet she was on or, or the ship or something like that. So that helps me a ton. Um, I wrote too fast to make a good Bible. So I don't have one. Mm-hmm. And I tried a couple of times to do it, but it would literally be the work of a year at this point to put together wow. a really good story Bible. So I luckily have enough annotations in my books that I can, I can put things together that way. I also have a really good memory, which helps me out too. Um, but I do strongly recommend to people that make a bible <laughs> if you're, you're going to start something like this but also don't get too carried away with details um if, if you're doing something like that because you because you you could spend so much time creating a bible to keep track of your stories that that becomes like your job almost so i recommend only what you need to survive the other really important thing if you're going to write a large interconnected thing is don't write details um don't say what people's high eye color is don't say what their hair color is um if they're going to say you know oh i was i was um I was over there, um, don't say like I was over there seven days ago, say I was over there like about a week ago. Cause then, mm-hmm. then you don't, then you're not being super specific. And then later on you can be like, oh, I was a couple of weeks ago, you know, right. but if you were being really specific and you were, you know, you were, you get it wrong, then your readers be like, you said it was seven days. Then later on you said it was nine days. But if you're like about a week, it's like, hey, that works either way, you know? So a it's lot actually, of flexibility. Yeah, it, it is really handy that way to like, not, not to paint yourself into corners basically, by, by being really specific and then having to remember all these details. It's also helpful in the future that people change their hair and eye color all the time. So it's like <laughs> my characters can, they actually sometimes look wildly different time to time. And also people do that now even, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, not everybody has the same hair color, eye color, hair length or anything for years at a time. It's perfectly normal right. for like, I'm gonna shave my head because it's freaking pandemic and I don't care. There you, you, know? like that. There you go. Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, so I love the fact that you don't get bogged down in those details and focus more on the plots and the stories and yeah. the world building. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because because people really aren't reading for those details anyway. They're reading because they want to have they want to get a release to see some cool characters doing some fun stuff. You know, yeah. In my case, a lot of pew pew in outer space and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If they're reading sci-fi, it's an escape and, yeah. and something completely different. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so we've got questions coming in and we're going to hop over there sure. real quick. All right. 
if you're a first time author, what are the best practices to network with similar genre authors um, if you don't have a wide network currently? I think that Facebook is still the number one way to find other authors um, and to go and just like search Facebook for groups in your genre. Um, you know, if you're writing fantasy, go look for fantasy author groups, like literally just type that into the Facebook search box and you're going to find a bunch of them. You might have to sift around a bit to find the ones you like, but you could totally do it. There are author communities that also exist on TikTok and on YouTube. There's a whole segment of YouTube called AuthorTube, and you can literally just search for AuthorTube on YouTube and you'll find people who, who, um, who are authors and stuff like that. You, it's, it's a little bit hard to have community with them because it's like you're watching one person talk and commenting on their videos. Um, Discord is another option too. There are a lot of author discords um, for different genres and whatnot. Um, I know that the RWA has a big um, uh, community. I think there's like a 10,000 person Discord server. Discord is like a, oh, wow. a chat server system. Um, and um, you can meet with people like that too. I, the one thing that I like about Facebook though is Facebook is one of the best ways to have um, like easily searchable, archivable information. Because if, you know, if someone asked a question about, I don't know, like what's what's the best size for a Kindle Vela cover? You know, chances are in your favorite author group, someone's asked that. You can just search in the group and there's gonna be an answer, you know? It's much harder to find those kinds of answers inside the community on other platforms. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's probably one that Googling would also be perfectly good, but um, but they're they're great for that. Um, and you can, you can really get to know a lot of people. And, um, mm -hmm. and also the great thing too is that authors love to friend other authors on Facebook. So you can very quickly start to get a, a really big group of friends who, who really feel like your tribe. And, and that's great. Like a lot of people always talk about Facebook as being this toxic, terrible place. I'm like, my Facebook is amazing. Like, I have all these people who are authors from my tribe. A lot of like um, women who are fashionistas and love style. Like, I uh, follow me and, and comment, and I comment on their stuff. Facebook for me is like this happy, uplifting place because um, I just think authors are just great people in general. And um, and I've sort of managed to build a tribe of just a lot of authors that are fun to hang out with there. And I, 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 we hear that time and time again, and I, I preach it too, because to your point, the author community is so, especially the indie publishing community, mm -hmm. we want everybody to succeed. And, yeah. and, and that's the amazing thing in sharing knowledge. Now you have a couple books out about writing and specifically about blurbs and metadata, is that correct? Yeah, the, well, there's three of them. There's the, the book called Help My Facebook Ads Suck, which was sort of the first one that started all of this because I had so many authors I was running to saying, I can't run Facebook ads. They don't work. I'm like, they do work. And here's how. Um, and then there's always all this debate about how to launch a book, rapid release, you know, all sorts of things like that. And I'm like, there's no one size fits all answer. Mm -hmm. um, I've done rapid releases that flop and I've done like slow and steadies that were amazing. You know, they, and there's, there's a lot of situational stuff. So we made another one called Help My Launch Plan Sucks. Um, and then the one thing that I hear, the other thing I hear a lot of authors saying, um, blurb writing is just miserable and I hate it and it makes me want to die. Um, <laughs> not to be overly dramatic, but it feels like that sometimes. So this one's not out yet, but this, but it will be very soon and it's called um, Help My Blurb Suck. Um, and I have this great way of writing blurbs that makes it easy and actually fun to write blurbs and add copy. And also the fact that the, the, the tools you use to break down your book into right feel right blurbs are also great for finding the right keywords to use the right um, uh, in Amazon the right audiences to argue to are to argue to, to um, advertise to um, on AMS or on um, on Facebook or things like that as well so it's I believe it's like the third week of July that it comes out and it's going to be I'm really excited about it because it's I think it's going to solve a really big pain point for a lot of authors. Uh, I, me too. We hear it all the time. All right. Yeah. So not giving away all the secrets in the book. Can you share a couple with us? So the interesting thing about the about blurbs, I think a lot of people forget, is that your blurb has to be written to market and it has to contain the key tropes for your market. Um, when people, especially when you're a new author, people don't know you, but they know like I love reading about which is in Maine, for example. You know, so make sure that you mention very early on in your blurb that your story is about witches in Maine. In fact, that should probably be in your book title and that should probably be somewhere on your cover, you know, and stuff like that. So so it's all about like identifying those tropes and making sure that all the ways that you're presenting your book, your in, in your copywriting, in your cover, your title and all that contain that. And then the other, this is the biggest pitfall that new authors have. Um, there should be no backstory in your blurb, like none. 
no backstory at all. Yes, the backstory is super important to the story, but it's just going to bog down your blurb and the reader doesn't, doesn't need to know it. They don't need to know that your character was like happily married in Oregon for seven years or something like that. They just need to know that they recently moved to Maine, you know, um, and that will let, allow you to get right to the thing. And you might be able to give a little bit like, you know, recently divorced um, character XYZ moves to Maine and finds, you know, um, that, that she's actually got sparkly fingers and, and is an amazing witch or something like that. Um, but you don't want to like give a lot of information about why she moved to Maine or where she came from. And, and newbie authors do that so much because I think, well, this is all important to know what her motivations were and stuff like that. It's like, yes, inside the book, but not in the blurb. Um, the other thing is, is names. Um, don't put more than two names in your blurb if you can, if you can avoid it because it's hard to remember which name is attached to which character when people are just reading blurbs. And especially if you have weird names, people will get turned off by names that they can't pronounce and can't remember and stuff like that. So most of my blurbs only have one name in them actually. Um, but I say two because I think if you're writing a romance, you kind of have to have two names. Right, right. Awesome tips. Thanks. All right. So you talk about putting yourself out there and being authentic and standing apart. As a self-proclaimed extrovert, do you have any advice for those of us that aren't quite so open in sharing um, or are even an awkward person? Well, um, I think one thing that, that helps with that is most readers are introverts too. So um, chances are that the people, that they're feeling just as awkward as you are. Mm -hmm. um, but readers are actually really excited to meet authors. They, they actually really like it. If they're showing up at an event that you're at, they're excited to be there. They might look shy and introverted, and like they, they might run away if, if someone makes a loud noise, but they, they really actually are excited to be there. So, you know, be warm, be welcoming. Um, if you're at an event, stand up. Um, don't, I mean, I, if you can't stand all day at an event, which even I can't do, um, don't obviously, but if, you know, if, if someone approaches your table, it's great to stand if you can and to greet them and whatnot or to be, to be welcoming in some other way, offer to, I mean, I don't know if you shake hands anymore. That not, might not be the thing to do, but the before times you would offer to shake their hands um, and stuff like that. Uh, another thing is that, um, I mean, you can always find an extrovert and attach yourself to them. Um, I don't, I don't mind that at all. I have a lot of introvert friends who are like, I'm be, making a beeline to Mal and then I'm going to get to meet everybody by just hanging out with Mal. Um, so that doesn't hurt either. Like, you know, and there's extroverts like me. I love to have like, author friends hanging out with me and stuff like that you know so and that's why that's why i'm like really visible you see me at an event i want to meet you like come over and say hi and, and hang out and we'll, we'll see some people um but i think the other thing too is like is like just sort of like and this isn't something that you can just easily do but you have to sort of accept that you are who you are and that's okay and if you can do that and just be like this is me um i actually i literally i do affirmations um, mm -hmm. that's where you sort of just basically talk yourself up. Um, and, um, before I go to events, stuff like that, I'll be like in my hotel room wearing some sort of crazy cat suit, taking deep breaths and be like, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it. People like me, which is Stuart Smalley from SNL. Stuart Smalley, yeah. I literally re recite Stuart Smalley. So like, even I get nervous about going out of these events and stuff like that. But I remind myself that like, I'm here because I wrote, I, I wrote a book which is something that very few people can even do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I got here, I have my book with me. There's people that are here that want to meet readers or from an author event, there are people here that want to hear me speak or something like that or want to talk to me. And and that's what we're here for. I remind myself, like, that's why we're all here, you know, it's and and that's and it, that everybody else wants to participate as well. So I, I talk myself up. I also do the litany against fear from Dune, which is like, you know, fear is, um, I can't remember the whole thing, but like, it's about how fear freezes your mind and you have to like push past the fear and you have to, and actually the thing in doing that I really liked is, and I think it's actually comes from, um, from some stuff in Hindu, but you have to like, you actually have to let the fear wash over you and then realize that you're still there and you're still standing and that, that, that it can't actually knock you down unless you choose to let it. And that's, that's kind of the philosophical approach I take to that, but also just remember that like everybody that's there wants to be there. So right. just enjoy that. And I think that everybody there, uh, I would say more than 50%, if you're in an author convention, are feeling the exact same way you are. Yes, um, I can speak from experience. Uh, when my, The first few that I went to were incredibly intimidating. And as an introvert, definitely go find an extrovert and just hang with them. You'll yep. meet everybody you need to know at that point. Yep. And chances are, like, look for people kind of like me. Like, look for the person wearing the funky hat, you know, yep. or the person who's, like, wearing a cat suit or you know, something like that. Um, 
and uh, and that typically means that they like being approached and they want to talk to people, you know, stuff like that. So you know, walk up to them and just say, hey. I mean, the greatest thing to say is if you're going to an author events, like you know, hi, uh, my name is is blank. Well, um, how are you doing? And say like, what do you like? To, what do you write? And if you're at a reader event, just say like, what do you read? We have this great thing in common, you know. We're all here about books and stories, so you can always lead with that. Mm -hmm. And people love talking about themselves. So if you ask someone what they write or ask them what they read, you, you might get more than you want, actually. So yeah, <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll definitely give you an earful. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's a great thing to do. Um, Dorothy wants to know, first of all, she says, love, love, love the cat suit. Um, <laughs> but she wants to know, how do you support and uh, motivate other authors that are part of your um, author group? I mean, I guess I guess there's two ways to support and motivate other authors. One of them is 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 just saying it's just sort of like reminding everybody that the best way to write books is to actually do it. Um, and and what what I believe really strongly is that um, if you, that people should write every day, even if you can only write like a paragraph, a sentence, write every day because it really helps you keep the story fresh in your mind. And that way, when you sit down to write, you don't have to be like, oh God, where was I or whatnot. You you know because you were just in the story writing yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. And what it'll actually end up doing is helping help you finish the book faster, and you'll get a better book done because you're actually gonna, you're not going to make as many mistakes because it's not going to be months between when you write. And once you sort of turn writing into a thing that you do every day, it actually becomes like a faucet that you can just turn on and off in your brain. You can just sit down and be like, I'm writing now, and just start writing, and you don't have to wait for the news to show up and whatnot. And I really feel like I encourage people to do that a lot. That's like my number one piece of advice: is write every day. And the sort of the sense of accomplishment accomplishment that you're going to get from doing that is in itself going to become very motivational. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, as well for authors, we have a lot that we have to think about because we're small business people wearing all the small business person hats. Plus, we have to be creative. And a lot of times, the things that happen in running a business hurt creativity to, as well. Um, like if your sales aren't that good that day, you can lose motivation to write. So whenever I write books, for me, I'm, I'm always writing the book for the story. I'm writing the book because I want to tell the story and I love it, and it's going to be amazing, and I love the characters and what they're doing, and I get a lot of fulfillment about typing the end and be like, I did it. Even after writing 110 books, whenever I read a book, I'm like, oh my god, I did it. This feels so good. And I celebrate, and I get, you have a drink of something, or Joe and I go out to eat at a restaurant um, or something like that, except for during COVID, we would just order in. <laughs> but um, but it's like I celebrate writing just for the uh, just for writing. And mm -hmm. I remind myself that I would actually write these stories even if no one was paying me to read them. I love writing stories. Um, and, I, and I make sure I keep all of that separate from all the business stuff in my brain. I mean, it's not, it's not I don't always win, and I'm always super successful at that, but I, I remind myself frequently that, that I, I'm here for the stories and the writing and the joy of, of create, being a creative person more than I am for the money. Um, and then I sort of like keep I, and I keep the money stuff differently and I, different in my brain. I also I, I organize my time so the time that is business time is not the same as writing time. And for me, that's very motivational. And I feel like that helps a lot of authors as well because they're like they they realize that okay, like I, it's okay to do this just because I love doing this. And if I'm successful, great. And if I'm not if successful financially, I should say, which is different than being successful at writing books. If I'm su successful financially, great. And if not, like it doesn't mean that I suck. It just means that. You know, I didn't, uh, maybe I'm not a great business person, which is okay, like not everybody is, or maybe mm -hmm. I didn't have the right book at the right time. Like I wrote, like I said, I wrote my first book in 2012 and no one read it for four years, you know, because I didn't do the right things at the right time. I wasn't a great business person, but that didn't mean it wasn't a great book. You know, if I had just I, given up I, and I published that, it still would have been a great book. But as it turns out, like I had, a, a, you know, a half a million people that have validated that I'm a good writer, which is nice. And I wouldn't have got that if I didn't keep doing it. Mm -hmm. I also, I also like to say that um, successful people only have one thing in common is that they didn't quit, yeah. you know, because if you quit, that's the number one way to not be successful in a thing. Right. So right. You keep doing it. Yeah. And, and to your point, trends change. Yeah, they do. Right. Absolutely. Go ahead. I'll just say absolutely. I'm agreeing. Trends change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So things that were working, you know, when you first started aren't going to be working now. Right. And things that may work now, you may have tried back then and wouldn't work then, but now work. Yep, exactly. And on top of that, too, like one of the things I've learned is the things that I do now to be successful are not the things that, that would work if I was starting out now. I, I put the analogies like if, you're, if your car is stalled inside of the highway and you need to get it somewhere, it works to push your car to get it moving. 
you know, that's a viable strategy to get your car moving. If your car is currently moving at 60 miles an hour and you want to make it go faster, opening your door and putting a foot in the highway <laughs> is not going to be a good move. You know, um, so you have to understand that the things that you do at different stages of your business and your journey are going to be different. And things that were great for building up, building you when you were smaller could actually destroy you if you do them when you get later. So you have right. to be and you have to and you have to realize, like, I guess one of the things to keep in mind, too, is that, like, we all like to like kind of like act like it's super easy to write books and it's just like, oh, it's all sunshine and roses, you know, and I'm just like dancing around in cat suits all the time. There are hard days and I, and I have them too. And I know that all the big authors have them. I'm friends with a lot of really big authors and they have days they can't write. They have days where they have imposter syndrome. I've, I know seven figure authors who have imposter syndrome and feel like, like it's all a sham and, and at any moment it can be whisked away and, and they didn't des deserve it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So just for, like, it's, I think it's useful to remember that like, it's, it's we don't live in a perfect world we all have struggles and that that you having struggles doesn't mean that you aren't valid and worthy and able to do this thing as well it's it's you're totally still valid and worthy and there's no reason why you can't be a writer too right right um so how do you write 20 books in a year you know what's the secret for getting that high daily word count necessary my butt is in the chair um that's like that's the number one thing you got to sit down and you got to do it and you have to you have to treat it like a job um uh -huh. before you become like and th this does this assumes that you want to be a full-time author not everybody does and so mm -hmm. I, I i don't want people to feel like they have to they have to be militant about this if they're purely writing for the joy of it but um if you want to have this be your career treat it like a career even before it is mm -hmm. um you know, make, make, treat it like it's like, I, this is my time I'm writing. It's like, I went this like, cause there's times like you go to work, you don't want to be at work. You still go to work and you do your job, right? You know, you right. sit down, you answer the emails, you respond to the clients, you do whatever you got to do. You know, you, you make that sandwich, you brew some coffee, whatever it is you got to do with your job, you do that. Uh, and writing is the same way. It's like, I've got to sit down and this is time to write a book and um, be smart about it. Like if you're sitting there and like zero words are coming out, you're like, well, maybe I could do some networking. Maybe I could do some research. Maybe I could like read a book on writing or something like that but do something that is forwarding your career. Um, and, and you'll find that the more you do it, it's like a muscle. The more you do it, the better you'll get at it. There's a sort of this weird thing where people sort of like, a lot of times have treated writing as if this thing you do alone on a mountaintop in a yurt, you know, and you slave over this one manuscript for 20 years and then it's amazing and you put it out. Writing books is something you get better at by writing more books. Um, mm -hmm. And KDP is great because we get like, we have this, live in this world now where we get this instant feedback, you know, and if you screw it up, screw up a book, it was even your intro thing. The guy's like, I made a mistake. I could go back and change it. It's like right. amazing. You can do that and you can learn, you can grow and you can get better. And, um, and, and that, that's something you can only do just by flexing that muscle and doing it over and over again, you know, and that's, that's, I guess that's my main piece of advice. The other thing is find account accountability partners. Um, mm -hmm. Find people that you can sprint with. If people aren't familiar with that term, it's a term used in writing for like writing for like 20 minutes and then taking a little break and then writing for 20 minutes again. And um, having accountability partners in writing is really important. I'm really lucky that Jill and I, both being writers, can use, use each other for that. But I still actually am in a number of writing groups online where I can like join in and have people to be accountable with and say, like, here's my work camp goal for the day. This is what I'm going for. And I'm actually, to be honest, I'm a slow writer. Um, I actually can only write at, at best like a thousand words an hour. Um, I sprint with like Amanda Lee a lot of the time and she can write 1600 words in 20 minutes, yeah. uh, sometimes in 15 minutes. She's unbelievable. Um, and like sometimes she'll write in like one hour what I can produce in a day. And I'm just like, God damn it. How does this woman do that? She's amazing. Um, and even, I've even had some newbie writers who are working their first book that can triple my word counts. It's just ridiculous. Right? So for me, it is just really the discipline of like butt in chair and get a book done. But if you think about it, a thousand words an hour is only typing at 16 words a minute. It's actually like super slow. That's like, you could finger peck that fast. Um, it's just something, but the ideas sometimes take a while to go, but, um, a thousand words an hour for three hours a day is 90,000 words in a month. That's the length of a, of a novel. So if okay. you can find three hours a day, you can write a novel in a month. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the more you do it, you'll eventually reach a point where you can write that novel in a month and like be able to skim over it and hand it to your editor. Um, like a lot of the great authors like Lee Child, um, Robert Heinlein, they do first, they do, they wrote one draft and then handed mm -hmm. it to them. They did not go over their book over and over and over and over again. They're just like, yep, I found a good editor. They know what they're doing. I wrote my one draft. I'm going to go hang out on the beach now. That's what Lee Child <laughs> does, the jerk. Um, I think Robert Highland worked harder than Lee Child, at least at that point in his career. You know, I'm sure Lee Child, Lee Child earned where he, where he got, but uh, yeah, yeah. A guy like, 
they, I mean, he's retired now, but uh -huh. um, like stories he from from some friends of his, and he like literally would work three weeks a year. He'd write a book in three weeks and then hand it off and be done. I'm like, wow, that's a dream, you know? All right. Um, so we've got about four minutes, and I've got two questions to ask you. The first one, no, you're you're fabulous. Uh, the first one is, um, do you have a military background? If you're writing in kind of military sci-fi, I don't actually know. I um, I wanted to join the military, but I was I was actually Canadian, and um, they didn't want me. Um, <laughs> that was probably too nice. But um, the the I did a lot of research. I actually spent two years studying military structures and how teams work in the military and talking with a lot of people that served and whatnot to get a really good feel for it. So I did my research and a lot of people are surprised when they find out I don't have a military background. So like you write military combat and strategy and everything is if you'd served. I'm like, nope, I just, I did my homework. So, and I, and I think that's a good note to know. You can write about a lot of things. You just have to do your homework. Right. And it makes it easier with the internet because there's so much information out there now. Yeah. You but it is share the stuff with you too. You can find people who will gleefully talk about their careers and what it was like and things like that. People love to talk about themselves, as it turns out. So find the right people and they'll share everything you need to know. All right. Before we wrap up, we've got more than one question about how to find your help my ex sucks um series. Where is that? And do you keep that separate from your sci-fi? Yeah, I write. So the, the nonfiction stuff I write for authors is under Mal Cooper. Um, so you can search for Mal Cooper on, on Amazon, or you can go to thewritingwives.com. That's Jill on my website. So it's thewritingwives.com. And there's a menu that says books, and you can get the books in there um, and dig in. There you go. Now, is the My Blurbs, uh, Help My Blurbs Suck a book up for pre-sale or pre-order? Yeah. yeah, it's on pre-order on, on Amazon. There you go. So everybody can go out and grab those. Absolutely. Any other way that people can contact? So you've got a couple different websites. Um, how can people reach out to you if they have follow-up questions? Um, they can certainly find me on, on Facebook. If you search for Mallory Cooper, you're going to find a picture of me in a cat suit. Um, and you can reach out to me that way. Um, you can go to thewritingwives.com and there's a chat or a contact that you can use to reach out. Um, and you can always just find me on, uh, you can actually find me on Instagram and message me there as well. Um, and on, on YouTube, I guess you can't really just directly message people. So yeah, not YouTube, but Instagram as Mallory Cooper as well. It's a great way to find me. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been fantastic. It's been great. I've enjoyed this so much. All right. Thank you all for joining us and happy publishing. Bye everyone. <laughs>